Hi, this is Pastor Craig Raymond, thanking you for joining us for this sermon series that I'm doing in 1 Thessalonians. It was a letter written by the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago, but speaks with great relevancy to our lives today. I hope that you will find encouragement and hope as you study it with me today. Thank you. We're doing a study of 1 Thessalonians, and I want to thank those of you who are joining us online. Hopefully you can hear me fine now. But we're doing a study of Paul's first letter to the Christ followers that lived in the city of Thessalonica. It was a small church in Macedonia, which is today northern Greece. And even though this letter was written 2,000 years ago, it still speaks with great power and relevancy to our day today. And in fact, this morning, we're going to talk about how to experience victory, how to experience strength, no matter what trial we may be going through. And as you know, there are all kinds of trials. You may be going through one yourself. Maybe it's a physical trial for you or someone you love, a health concern. Maybe it's a relational trial, a conflict, whether at work or at home or at school, wherever you may be, in the community. Maybe it's a financial trial, trying to make ends meet. Whatever the nature of the trial, all trials have one thing in common, and that is suffering. Pain and grief, even loss. But today, I want to talk to you about how we can experience victory over our trials. How we can experience God's daily strength to get through our trials, no matter what they are. And so whatever you're facing, I want to encourage you to continue to choose faith over fear, hope over despair, and love over hate. And so we're going to look at that this morning, how to have victory. You know, the Thessalonian church was a suffering church. You need to know that historically about them. They were suffering from persecution because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. But that was not their true identity. It was their experience, but it wasn't their identity. They were not a defeated church. Yes, they were suffering. They were being ostracized by those countrymen where they lived. They were being criticized. They were being demonized by their neighbors. If they owned a business, they were being boycotted because of their commitment to Christ, kind of like some of the businesses in our country today are experiencing. But in the midst of all that, the Thessalonian church was a victorious church. And they overcame their trials because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So I want you to understand that though persecuted, they were not a defeated church. They were a victorious church, the kind of church God wants us to be today. You know, this COVID-19 has been going on for 10 months and who knows when it's going to end. It's brought so much disruption. Some of you joining us online haven't been able to be with us for 10 months, and we miss you. I want you to know that. We miss all those who aren't able to be here. But no matter what the future may hold, no matter how long this pandemic may last, I want you to know we are not going to be defeated. The gates of Hades, Jesus promised, will not prevail against his church. We will go on. We will continue to live for Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk about how we can experience victory, not only as a church, as a whole, but as individuals, what you're going through, to give you some hope and encouragement for your situation, whatever it may be that you're facing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Romans 8, 37, the Apostle Paul gives us this statement. He says, we are more than conquerors. I love that phrase. More than conquerors through him who loves us. Not in our strength do we conquer, but in his strength who leads us and guides us. We are more than conquerors. Well, the Thessalonian church there in the first century could identify with this. And what I want to do with you today is just go on a journey and together discover what, what did the Thessalonians do that made them more than conquerors in their trials. And as we look at our passage for today, which is chapter 2, 
verses 13 through 21, the end of chapter 2, starting at verse 13, we detect three faith steps that the believers in Thessalonica did that we need to do as well if we're going to have victory over our trials, if we're going to persevere and keep our eyes on Jesus and continue to live for Him. Three faith steps that will help us to be more than conquerors over our trials, whatever they may be. So let's look at these steps of faith. Step number one, we must activate God's Word in our lives. Activate. As you know, God's Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter uh, 4, verse 12 tells us that. God's Word, think of the promises of God. It's like a dynamic force within us that will help us to endure any trial that we may face on the outside. But how do we experience this power? Well, we need to activate it. We need to do the things that the Thessalonians did when they first heard God's Word, when Paul was amongst them and shared the gospel with them. There were three things that they did that, in a sense, activated God's powerful Word in their souls. These are the same three steps we need to take. So let's look at what, he, what Paul says they did. Verse 13 of chapter 2, Paul writes, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, you welcomed it, not as the Word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work, notice, its work in you who believe. Did you notice those three key words that Paul mentions that the Thessalonians did that truly made God's Word a powerful influence in their lives? God's Word on the inside will prepare us for whatever we may have to face on the outside. He said, first of all, these are the three things we need to do with regards to God's Word. We must accept God's Word. We must accept it for what it really is, the inspired Word of God. Not the words of man, but the words, God's message, inspired to us. We must accept it with the authority that it has. Second, we must welcome God's Word into our hearts. The second word that Paul uses in this passage, is translated in my New American Standard Bible as accepted, literally means to receive it openly and gladly, to welcome it into your heart. That's what we need to do. And then third, we must believe God's Word for ourselves. At the end of verse 13, Paul says that God's Word works in you who believe. It's a powerful force, a dynamic in your life if you're willing to receive it, welcome it, and believe in it. Apply it to your life. Now, as we all know, God's Word has no effect on those who don't receive it and welcome it and believe it. You probably know of people who have heard God's Word and they dismiss it, they ignore it, they reject it, they read God's Word and it has no effect. It's literally in one ear and out the other. For God's Word to have a dynamic influence, to encourage your heart, to strengthen your heart right where you need it, you need to be in God's Word reading God's Word, hearing God's Word, but you need to receive it as being from God. You need to welcome it gladly into your heart, submit to its authority, and then you need to believe it. Believe in the promises, the statements of God that we find in His Word. These are the things that I say activate God's Word as a dynamic influence in our lives. When we receive God's Word, welcome God's Word, and believe God's Word, well, it unleashes that dynamic force of God's Word inside of us. The Holy Spirit goes to work and strengthens us on the inside so that we can face whatever we may have to face on the outside. Whatever you're going through, God's Word will strengthen you. Let me give you an illustration. Have you ever wondered how a giant squid which has a soft body, can survive water pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Pressure so great that even a submarine can't go that deep. But there sits a squid. How can it do that? What keeps it alive? 
Well, the answer has to do with oxygen, with air. Oxygen collapses under too much pressure. But fluids without oxygen in them do not. They are incompressible. A submarine contains oxygen. The sailors have got to breathe inside. And so it can be pressurized to the point where it can be squished. It can basically be um, uh, broken down. But a squid contains no air, no oxygen in its blood. So its pressure on the inside of a squid matches the pressure on the outside. It has no oxygen in its blood. Interesting how God designed it. Trials, think of it this way, trials are like a weight, a pressure that bears down in our lives and, can, and wants to squish us, to defeat us. But God's Word on the inside gives us the strength and will counteract whatever pressure we may face on the outside so it cannot defeat us. So when we activate God's Word, remember what we need to do. We need to accept it as God's Word with the authority of God's Word. We need to welcome it into our hearts, take it seriously, and we believe in it, act on it. When we do, then God's Word becomes that dynamic force, that pressure that, as it were, on the inside that will help sustain us no matter what the pressure is on the outside. And what this means is trials can hurt us. They, they do. They discourage us and can affect us. Maybe you're going through a discouraging time right now in your life. Trials can get us down. But even though trials can hurt us, they cannot defeat us. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Do you agree with that? We really are, folks. We really are. So if you want to be victorious, whatever you're going through, whatever trial, hardship, challenge that you're going through, you need to activate God's Word in your soul. Get into His Word. There's no substitute for that inner strength and to spend time with God daily in His Word. And as you read it, accept it for what it is, God's authoritative Word. Welcome it into your heart and believe it. Act on it. That's what we need to do. And God's Word will be like that system of protection that will protect us on the inside from whatever the pressure is on the outside. Second, what else must we do to be conquerors, more than conquerors in Christ? Well, we must imitate those who have endured suffering. We must identify and learn from those who have gone through persecution and difficulty in their life. When it comes to trials, that's why we have support groups. Whatever trial you're going through, there's a support group, a group of people meeting who have gone through it or are going through it and found strength. And we gain from that sharing. Well, the principle is the same when it comes to suffering persecution. We need to learn from those who have endured persecution in their lives and learn from it. Learn from their example. Paul commends the Thessalonians for doing this. They were imitators of those who had been suffering before them. In verses 14 through 16 of chapter 2, he writes, For you, brethren, became imitators, there's our word, imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, in Israel. Jewish-led churches in Judea, they've been suffering persecution early on for their faith. He says, you imitated them, for you also endured the same kind of sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen even as they did from their Jewish countrymen, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They, those opposing the gospel, are not listening to God or pleasing to God. They may think they are, but they're not. Instead, they are hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that these, the opposers, always fill up the measure of their sin. But wrath, God's judgment has come upon them to the utmost. Paul's being predictive here, prophetic, and saying they're going to eventually get it from God. God's judgment is coming against them. In our passage, Paul commends the Thessalonian believers for enduring persecution, just like the Jewish Christians were doing around Jerusalem in the Judea area of Israel. Their perseverance 
indicated that they were true followers of Christ. Now, why did their countrymen there in northern Greece, Macedonia, why did their countrymen hate them and persecute them? Well, it's because of their faith. It's because these Thessalonian believers did not and would not declare Caesar as Lord, like everyone else was. Instead, they made it clear only Jesus is Lord. And that made them, as perceived by many in their day, as a threat to the imperial social order of Rome. And therefore, they were subject to persecution, to hatred. Today, we as Christians are being perceived by more and more people Today, in our own country, the land of the free, the home of the brave. But sadly, today, we are being perceived by more and more people as a social threat to the new social order of our day. This week, Tony Perkins, some of you have heard of Tony Perkins. He is the head of the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. We have had Tony here at this church years ago. I've been there and met him and went on a tour of his fine facility in D.C. They're basically a watchdog for Christian concerns that are happening in our nation's capital through legislation. And this week, Tony Perkins issued an article entitled, Five Ways to Prepare for the Days Ahead. Kind of serves as a warning, five ways to prepare. And in this article, it's interesting because he interviews missionary Andrew Brunson. You may have never heard of him, but he was sentenced some time ago in Turkey, the country of Turkey, to life imprisonment because he dared proselytize others for Christ, sharing his faith and planting churches. He was sentenced to life because of his outspoken ways and sharing the gospel. Fortunately, he was limited to two years of hard time before he was released, thankfully. Now, Andrew Brunson is in our country, and his burden is to prepare us in the United States for the persecution that very well could be coming our way. And I know that's a message not all of us like to hear. We like to think, oh, it's going to be fine, Craig. Don't over-dramatize this thing. Come on, don't kid yourself. For 2,000 years, Christianity has been viewed by many as a threat. We've been living in a bubble for 240 years here in America. That's because our forefathers came from Europe mainly, primarily, to escape persecution. They wanted religious freedom. And now, 240 years later, that freedom to serve the God of your conscience is being threatened more and more by some, not all, by some. And Brunson's heart burden is to prepare us living in our country, to prepare for a harsh time of persecution. He writes this, and I want to quote what he says. He says, there is a real sea, sea change, think of a tidal change, taking place in our country in our generation. The hostility toward followers of Jesus Christ is going to rise like a tide. The pressure is coming, and it's coming very quickly. One thing I want to underline from my experience is that those who persecute you are going to justify it by saying that we're hate groups, that we have a message of hate. That is going to be tough to take. People are going to say that Christians are a threat to safety. You can't work here. Your views make people feel unsafe. You can't use social media, so we'll be censored. Compromise of our faith, our convictions, will be the easy way out. Then he says, Jesus tried to steal, toughen his followers against the, that impulse to sell out, to compromise, by reminding them that he was hated. He said, look, they hated me. They rejected my message, so they're going to hate you and reject your message. The servant is not greater than the master. Jesus was preparing his disciples. Brunson and others feel that we need to be prepared as well. 
Andrew Brunson then gives five practical steps. I just want to share them with you of what we need to do to be prepared for the persecution that many believe is coming our way, just simply because of our identity to Christ. One, we must identify with those who are being persecuted in other countries. Persecution has been going on in many lands for, for decades, generations. It may be kind of new to us to be penalized because you're a Christian, but not in many countries. Think of the Muslim countries of this world. We need to identify with our persecuted brothers and sisters. Two, we must pursue intimacy with God. Folks, if ever there was a time to know what you believe and why, this is it. If ever there was a time to be strong in your faith, this is it. If ever there was a time to connect with others in a small group and encourage one another and support one another, this is it. Don't try and go through this storm alone. We need to pursue intimacy with God. Three, we must develop the right perspective. We must fear God and not man. Remember what Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill your body. Fear him who can kill your body and soul in hell. Fourth, we must determine ahead of time to follow Jesus no matter what. Our commitment is to follow him, no matter what the cost. And then five, he says we must stand on the word of God even if it costs us. Stand on the promises of God no matter what. Folks, this is what Christians have been doing for centuries as, they've, as they have gone through tough times. Think of those in China, the underground church. Persecution, rather than kill the church, really the church thrives on it. And the church in China has grown, grown tremendously. We too need to thrive under this kind of persecution, however it may come, whenever it may come. We must imitate those who have suffered before us, learn from them, and stay faithful to Jesus no matter what. Amen, folks? Amen. Nobody wants to be hated. Nobody wants to be a source of controversy. And let's make sure it's not because of our hate. Just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you hate them. Let's be clear about that. Hold to your faith convictions and know that increasingly in workplaces, it's going to maybe cost you. Be faithful to Jesus no matter what. We need to imitate those who have gone through persecution, who have suffered well for the sake of Christ. And then third, we also must remember the third step. We must participate, or excuse me, anticipate Jesus' return. He's coming again. And no matter how dark things may seem in our lives, in our world, Jesus, the light of the world, is coming. And our hope is a living hope because it's based on a living Savior. And so we don't go around discouraged and defeated. We have a hope. The Apostle Paul was not one to always live in the past and filled with fear and remorse. He was one who looked to the future and was filled with hope because his eyes were centered on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In verses 17 through 20, here in chapter 2, Paul shares his desire to see these Thessalonian believers again. He wants to visit them once again. And he expresses his frustration at not being able to do so. And in, and in sharing this, he lets us know who's the one who's behind our trials, all of our trials. Who is that enemy of the soul? Paul tells us here in verses 17 through 20. Let's look at it. He says, but we, brethren having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. They wanted to, Paul says, we want to see you again. For we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once. And yet, here it is, Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or our joy or crown, our victor's crown? Think of a victory uh, wreath, laurel, uh, headdress. Uh, who is our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. What a positive way to address these people. What encouragement that Paul gives. He closes his paragraph here in chapter 2 
by declaring his love and his esteem for these Thessalonian Christ followers. He expresses how many times he wanted to see them, but was prevented or hindered by Satan, who's always working behind the scenes to thwart, to interfere with God's will. We don't know the precise nature of this opposition from the evil one, Maybe it was weather delays that prevented Paul from coming back. Maybe it was persecution that kept him from visiting again. Or maybe it was a physical illness that Paul had. We know that he had a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12 talks about that. And maybe that physical ailment kept him from returning. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that thorn in the flesh is referred to as an instrument, a tool of the devil. We don't know, though, what kept him But whatever the nature, the cause of his delay, we do know what prevented him, and that was Satan. It was caused by Satan. And that means you can be doing the will of God, you can be at the very center of God's will for your life and still facing frustration and difficulty. In fact, count on it. Jesus never promised us that when we trust in him and follow him, everything's going to be easy. And again, Satan will do whatever he can to hinder us and discourage us and bring things into our lives. And I want you to know this, don't be defeated. You continue to choose faith over fear and hope over despair and love over hate because Satan would love to defeat you, but stronger is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen, folks? And so we need to live in light of that victory and know that this trial, however long it may last, this this suffering, it's only temporary. It will only last even if it lasts for a long time, only for this life. Jesus is coming again, and Paul reminds him of that great hope. He says, when the Lord comes again, he says, you will be our joy and our crown. When Jesus comes, you will be my crown, my glory. You will be my pride and joy before Jesus. That's a great statement, great thought. The Thessalonian believers were a deep source of pride and joy for the Apostle Paul. I want to ask you, who's been a source of pride and joy in your life? Maybe it's your spouse, a boyfriend, girlfriend in your life who's really inspired you. Maybe it's your children who are your pride and joy. I think most parents can say that. Maybe it's your grandchildren. For some of us, lucky enough, your great-grandchildren. They're your pride and joy. Maybe it's a friend, someone you've influenced you've mentored, and you've seen the changes, the progress in their lives, and it's encouraged you. Let them know that. Let them know that they are your pride and joy and how proud you are of them and the progress they're making. Encourage those around you. That's what Paul's doing here. He was an encourager, and didn't Jeff say today's National Day of Encouragement? We need to be encouraging one another. All the more as we see the day of the Lord drawing near. So remember that role that you can have in someone else's life. You don't know the battles others are facing. We have a way of kind of acting like we got it all together and we're just maintaining going strong, but you don't know those inner struggles, that inner pain. Be an encourager. This week, in midweek, I had one of our members who hasn't been able to be here just send a note letting letting me know how much... um, I have been an encouragement in his life. And I wrote back and just said, thank you. Thank you so much for those words of encouragement. We never know the private battles people are facing, but we can be an encourager, someone who lifts others up. That's your role. Paul knew that his, these young believers in Christ were suffering, persecuted. They were They were being boycotted and hated in their hometown because of their commitment to Christ. And he's lifting them up and encouraging them. He says, I want you to know this. No matter what happens, when Jesus comes again, and he is coming again, you will be my crown of glory. We think of a crown that we're going to wear. Paul says, I'm not going to wear a crown. You, my converts in Christ, will be my crown and glory. It's a beautiful picture, beautiful idea. So for Paul, his crown was not a laurel wreath that he was going to wear, but the people he has led to the Lord. That's an incredible idea to know that when you invest your life in people for Jesus, you're making an internal investment 
Think of the things we get so excited about that mean nothing. Right now there's the NFC and AFC championship games. I bet you you have your favorites picked out. Who cares? What, what is, and that's hard for me to say because I'm an ex-sportsaholic. Every once in a while, I, I get back into that groove. But we get so excited about things that don't matter. We forget about things that do. The people that God has brought around you, they're your mission field to encourage and strengthen and be a good witness to. Can you imagine one day standing in heaven and somebody coming up to you? It might even be your family member. Someone maybe you didn't really even know you had this impact, but someone coming up and saying, thank you, your faith has encouraged me and influenced me when I was in my life back on earth. Thank you for being an inspiration to me. Thank you for sharing your faith with me. Wow. Think of moms who sit and share those Bible stories and the gospel with their children and dads. The investment one day when your kids will join you in heaven and be able to say, thanks, Mom, thanks, Dad. These are our pride and joy, our crown and glory as we stand before Jesus, people we've influenced for Jesus in our lives. That's what Paul's saying here. And don't miss his basic message. Live in light of eternity. Jesus is coming again. He mentions his coming. That word in the Greek is a very important word. It's parousia. It means coming. It means arrival, usually of someone important. But it means more than that. Specifically, parousia, coming, means triumphal coming. Coming in victory. And it should remind us that when Jesus comes again, he's going to come with great glory and power and victory. And he's going to take his rightful place upon this earth. How many of you are looking forward to that day? I know I am. Some of you might be saying, could he wait a little bit longer? I'd like I had some things I want to do. But he's coming. And it's going to be in great glory and great power and great victory. We need to live in light of that. Whatever we're going through personally or nationally, or globally, it's going to pass. One day, Jesus is going to come, so live in light of that victory. Claim that. Well, Paul has outlined for us today three faith steps that we need to take if we're going to be victorious over whatever trial we're going through. We must activate God's Word by, remember, receiving it, welcoming it into our hearts, and believing it. Second, we need to imitate those who have endured suffering, who have stayed faithful to Christ, even though it cost them, and follow their example. Imitate. And then three, we must live daily in light of eternity. Jesus is coming. We need to anticipate that coming. Know that he is coming. So what challenge, as we close, are you facing today? What challenge are you going through in your life? Think about that. Whatever it is, give it to Jesus, knowing that his grace, his strength is sufficient for whatever you're going through. He will guide you. He will provide for you. He will help you. Sometimes Jesus changes our circumstances, and sometimes he changes us through our circumstances. Sometimes he allows us to go through those trials so that we can be a witness for him. Look at it that way. And remember to live for him, because one day you're going to stand before him. And you're going to hear his words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy, the joy of your master. Live in, live in light of that joy that's coming. Yes, we live in uncertain and scary times right now. Who knows what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. So let's continue to put our faith in him. Let's not be defeated in any way as followers of Christ because we know who's in charge of those who think they're in charge. And we know he holds the future. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen? Let's bow our heads. As our eyes are closed, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that right now. The most important decision you can make 
in your life is to receive the one who gave his life for you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross, not for his sins, but for yours and mine. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible tells us God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We will be declared acceptable in his sight, not because we earned it or, or merited it, but because of grace, what Jesus did for us. So I want to invite everyone here, please make sure you know where you're going to spend eternity, that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. You're relying on nothing else but the finished work of Jesus, the redemptive power that is found in him. And Father, I pray that all of us here would just be encouraged. I know there's trials and difficulties as part of living in a fallen world. Right now, we have an uncertain future as a nation, as a world, a pandemic that continues to go on and on and affects so many. But we just pray your strength, your blessing, help us to be an encouragement to others, like Paul was to the Thessalonians, to lift others up, to encourage others and inspire others with our faith and hope in you. Thank you for what you're going to do. We ask your blessing on this day. And all God's people said, amen.